Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Let's Start a Cult Podcast, Episode 9. I'm Kev Feezy, and this is... Matt Stevens. Matt Stevens, as always. Um, and yeah, we're, we're still here. We're still in lockdown, lockdown London. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're continuing to tell the tale of the fears and the dead. Um, we've got pretty far along, but um, what have you been up to this week, Matt? This week, um, I've been trying to record guitar parts for our new album and and, and hitting a wall occasionally. Um, Happens to all of us. Yeah, it's, it's just this, because um, we've got lots of toys to play with sound-wise, it becomes a little bit more disorientating. And um, I've been trying to just force myself to use sounds we haven't used before. Yeah. Um, cause I think there's no point making another record unless we can do something new with it. So, you know, it's just, there's no point just knocking another one out. Is there? I think it's perspective as well. Cause I mean, you've, you know, you sent me some, uh, some bits, um, and sort of like said, Oh, I'm not sure. You know, I just kind of did this this afternoon and I thought it's absolutely blinding stuff. You know, sometimes when you're doing it yourself, you can't sort of hear it. Can you? Yeah. It, well, it's very kind. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to, because it's another thing is when you try new sounds, one of the problems with, with our band is there's, Certain sounds that don't like a lot of big synths, like modern synths, don't really sit well with us, do they? No, they don't. That's true. It's quite hard to get. I mean, I don't want to use like retro sounds, but if we were to use like really modern, like prog metal synths or something, or prog metal guitar sounds, or it just wouldn't sit with our band, would it? No, it does. It doesn't work. We've got more yeah. of a sort of. Uh, I suppose it's 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 got a, not exactly vintage, but it's got kind of a. Uh, a classic sort of feel to a lot of the sounds we use. We use a lot of orange ampy sort of sounds. Yeah. We use a lot of SVT type bass sounds. We're always looking for a more analogy sound, something that's warm. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> well, I got yeah. Was it? I mean, I got. Um, I bought. I bought. Did I tell you? I bought a flanger pedal. You got a what, man? Bought the the more electric lady flanger pedal. Oh wow, nice. I've got that one. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, I've. Basically, a lot of the modulation sound, I use all these, this is very nerdy, I use these Eventide H9. Yeah. And I use um, a lot of the digital um, modulation sounds aren't that good. So I yeah. bought like a cheap phaser and a cheap uh, flanger. And they're an- like real analog ones, like more ones. Yeah. But they're real analog models of, you know, old circuits and they don't half sound good. So yeah, it's something, um, isn't it? It's the harmonics, apparently. Um, I don't I don't know. I mean I I am not really a big one to you know, I don't buy I've got a lot of gear, but I haven't got a lot of classic gear. I haven't got a lot of vintage gear. No. Because a lot of the time that stuff just breaks all the time, doesn't it? Yeah. I remember seeing one of those, um for those who don't know, there's a, for most all guitarists will know about these on the internet. There's um, these things called rig rundowns where guitarists sort of stand there and tell, you know, tell you what they play and how they play. And there was one with, what's the fella's name from the Stray Cats? Brian Seltzer? Setzer? Brian Seltzer. Yeah. Setzer, yeah. Um, and they were saying that he uses this particular amp, which has a particular tube in it. And because this amp is like a, you know, a very old amp and it's his sound and, you know, his signature thing, his guitar techs were saying they'd... They're basically, you know, they've, they've brought as many of these amps as they can possibly find because they're obviously no longer manufactured. And they actually found the place that sells the tubes for them and brought all the stock that exists in the world um, because mm. they weren't they weren't produced anymore. But once that runs out, I say it, it's gone, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not that fussy about gear, really. No. I mean, what I, I'm looking for, like, what I tend to be looking for is the interesting sounds. Yes. Like, I, I want sounds that sit well with the band but aren't like anything we've done before. And that's really hard to find because it's really hard to find um, interesting sounds, but they don't necessarily fit with the fierce and dead. So what I've been doing is I've been getting like interesting modulated sounds or you know harmonizer type sounds, then putting them through um, analog delay pedals. I've got um, uh, electro harmonics analog delay pedal somewhere, and I've been putting it through that just to dirty it up a bit and make it less. I think that's it's that kind of. I always think of Portishead's third album, where it's kind of very modern. Yeah, but it's like um, it's like posh lo-fi, isn't it? It is. There's there is hi-fi I mean, lo-fi. That's, that's definitely <laughs> there's there's so much stuff out there, man. There's so much cool stuff out there, but there is a lot of stuff out there now that will make you sound like you're doing uh, some kind of um, keyboard demo. Yeah, I mean, if, it's like if I was to use like Devin Townsend sounds. Yeah, I'd just sound silly because they they sound fantastic with him. But they just wouldn't sit with the, the aesthetic we've got, would they? No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, there you go. That's what Matt's been up to. Matt's been um, sculpting sounds. Sonic sculptor Matthew Fa- Stevens. Failing, failing to sculpt sounds. What have you been up to, Kevin? Um, I've been taking your Sonic sculptures and putting them into, <laughs> into our songs. That's, making, uh, I've been making doing some of that. Demos, you know? isn't you? So... And Stuart's been doing electronic drums at home, so yeah. and Steve's been tracking guitars as well. So we are trying to make a new album and you know getting on with it. So <laughs> right, should we tell this story then? Yeah. So we've we've um, uh, the last episode we we spoke about the Euphoric. So we got to the end and we, we finished the Euphoric album. I just quickly wanted to talk about um, Robert Ramsey, who very kindly did some spoken word on the album for us. Yes, we forgot now, to Rob's mention it last time, didn't we? Yeah, we, we, well, it's, you know, it's a big torrent of stuff, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, and he did all those, um, did the spoken word on 48K, wasn't it? Yeah. That little bit of spoken word on there. He, he's just got a really good voice. He just sounds really cool. Yeah. And he's a really interesting and lovely man. So we're very pleased to have him on there. Um, Mark Duffy, um, oh, yeah. Mark's another friend of ours who did all the videos for the Euphoric, um, yeah. and he did some amazing animation, um, really talented guy, really nice man. And he, and I think, I really think those, you know, those sort of retro animated style videos really made a difference in the campaign for the album. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, think as- a lot of people got into those, didn't they? Yeah. As, as well, it was quite nice having people that, I mean, we, you know, we have ideas and stuff, but we're not very good at, you know, artistic ideas. We're not very good at putting them into practice. And it's quite nice to sort of say to somebody, just do what you want. And then just getting something back and mm. not knowing anything about it at all and just getting something. It's really cool. Really cool to see how people interpret your, your music, you know. And, um, Ash uh, Jones, who we've worked with for years. Yeah. He made like the arc video, um, you know, he's another one of our sort of regular collaborators. He took all our photos. Yes. And also he um, uh, contributed, he edited the live footage for the Rosfest um, uh, album and, yep. and video. So all that stuff that was on the album, we ultimately put onto YouTube and Ash edited all that for us very That's kindly right. and did a fantastic job of it. And he's a real pleasure to work with. He's a really nice guy. Um, and then the team at BEM got the album out there for us and did a really good job on that. And mm-hmm. it was really well received. It got really good reviews. Um, yeah. It was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we had um, we did one gig um, uh, at the... Uh, Blackheart. Blackheart, the launch gig there. It went really well. And then we got booked in for um, gigs with Hawkwind. That's right. And we got Cosfest, and we got loads of sort of gigs we'd always wanted to do. It was yeah. really cool. We got the Hawkwind. Hawkwind took us out for two, two or three gigs. It was two gigs. Yeah, it was a seaside two gigs, special. A seaside. One in Margate. Couple one of in seaside Weymouth. shows, and you know, always, you know, childhood f- fans of Hawkwind, and you yeah, know, it was a really big deal for us, wasn't it? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. But um, basically, two weeks after the album came out, I got a bit sick. Um, I had cancer which wasn't very never never a nice thing to get um and so that was a bit of a shocker to be honest um i didn't really sort of talk about it at the time but i I sort of lost a lot of weight and sort of you know Mm. just i had to get fit basically quite quickly yes i didn't really talk about it much at the time but when we were doing those hawk so we had to cancel cosfest which i I was gutted about um because i was ill and that was the night the night we were supposed to be playing cosfest I was in surgery and a tumour removed, which is, you know, one of the most, you know, just, it was yeah, an unbelievable know, experience. Yeah. None of it seemed real. Um, and talking about it now, it doesn't even seem real. Um, and, you know, we were all set up to have this, you know, we were really pleased the album was finally out. You know, we'd been waiting years to get this record out and mm. people heard it and it got really good reviews and it was really positive. And then, and I got properly ill and, yeah. um, you know, it was, took me a long time to recover from it. When we did the Hawkwind dates, I wasn't well, was I? No, you, you was, um, I remember that we'd, we'd kind of, kind of settled and they'd given you some news about how it was going to go and, and everything. Yeah. And I remember on the first night we'd actually, we were just about to sound check. It was at Dreamland in Margate and, um, you got a phone call saying that they changed dates on surgery, some of the procedures you had to have. And it, it, it was like all of a sudden everything was shifted again, wasn't it? And, and, and but the show must go on. Two or three lots of surgery. And mm. it's not the news you want when you're going to go and play in front of like a thousand people in Margate or whatever. No, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was surreal. The whole thing was surreal. 
Yeah. And um, I was very lucky to have, you know, some really good friends. David from Bad Elephant was really there for me. Mm. Guys in the band. Joe Kendall from the Mighty Prog was a very kind and yeah. really good friend. And I was very lucky to have a few good mates around, you know, all my friends back home, like John yeah. and Justin, you know, those guys who are always old mates and stuff. But I was lucky to have a lot of people I could stay in touch with. But... You know, when someone says to you, oh, right, you know, mate, right, I'm afraid you got cancer. And it's just, um, it doesn't seem real. And the whole thing, it was just bizarre. The whole experience didn't seem real. And I, I'm, I'm okay now. I still have treatment to, you know, I still get checked and stuff yeah. regularly, but I'm all right. But it was um, a real shock, wasn't it? And I, I remember I phoned yeah. you the day I, I found out the news, didn't I? I was, oh, yeah. I mean, it was just shocking. I mean, it was, it was, just, bit, it, was you know. it was a terrifying thing to have happen. But so... But the main reason I'm telling this part of the story is that is the next year we did London, we did um, the uh, did some more the London, we did the Lexington, mm-hmm. and then we did um, Freak Valley, Cosfest, a New Day. So, but basically, it, those all those gigs felt really joyous to me because I thought I would, I thought I was. You know, I never thought I'd do any more shows. I thought we'd had it basically. Yeah, and um, to, to and then to come back and do, I think that run of festivals in yeah. London and Manchester shows we did was probably my favourite shows we've ever done um, because I just I really appreciated them because I thought we'd never do it again and, it, and especially you know Freak Valley was really uh, yeah. Cosfest and you know we got the live at Cosfest album didn't we out of that as well we did yeah and, you know that, I think that's we, we were playing that's the best we ever played those gigs wasn't it. I think um, to draw a positive from it and, you know, um, what positives you can um, is is to say, really, I mean, once you were kind of, um, you know, on, on the road to recovery, um, you know, everything was going in the right direction. It, it gave us so much perspective. I mean, I remember mm. on the night of the, the, the Hawkwind gig when you got this news and it was all very bewildering. I mean, you know, we, we, we're, we're all mates. We grew up together, me, Steve, Stuart, Matt, you know, and all the the rest of the band just said to Matt, you know, we just turned around and said like, right, do you want, do you want us to pull it? Do you want us to just, you know, cause <laughs> there's no way we're going to make you do anything. And that, that was more important than anything else. So once you did sort of get back on the road to recovery, it made us all think, and to be honest with you, um, you know, none of us are getting any younger, but all of us took mm. our health a bit ser- more seriously. You know, we all kind of appreciated all the opportunities we were being given. And mm. I think that gave, you know, actually as a positive, it gave the live shows a new kind of kick at the kick at, kick at the arse, really. I think after that, every show was the last one for me. Yeah. Everyone was the, the last time we did get to do this. And yeah. I did, I did, I, cause you, you never know, do you? I mean, I, it didn't make me all morbid and sad. It just made me enjoy every time we did it. Yeah. It made me feel really lucky and happy. It, it wasn't, there was no negativity. For, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of my mental health, that was probably the most, ha- the happiest I've ever been because, you know, I just realized how lucky I was to have a family and friends and, yeah. You know, and and be able to play in a band with my mates and play music that we was completely uncommercial and yeah, literally just pulled out of our head for the fun of it, and have a small but appreciative audience who like it, and yeah. get to go, and then we get to go and do these festival shows where we get to play in front of a few thousand people and, and have a really good time. So I'm going to actually explain something here to people as well um, that I don't think a lot of people really understand is most people think you're in a band, you know, you're, you're gunning for glory, you know, and sometimes you'll sort of say to, um, civilians, <laughs> oh yeah, we played a gig last night. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was great. You know, 70 people turned up and a lot of people look at you and go, oh, okay, that's, that's not a huge amount. Now, most smaller bands who know anything about anything, if you put on your own show, you're not, um, you know, you're not signed to a big label or, or maybe you're not signed at all. You drive across the country to another town, for example, Manchester. You know, you might know, know some people up there and, you know, but you put on a show with your name on the top of it and 70 or 80 people turn up, take time out of their day to come to see you, to pay money, you know, uh, however much money that might be, to come in and see you. That is an achievement. Mm. Yeah, you know? a lot to us. That, the, the, the London shows... We did a few sold out London, sold out Manchester. We did all those festivals, mm. 
And it just felt like, you know, we, in terms of the stuff we wanted to do when we started, we, we sort of developed that cult audience. And we got onto the festivals you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it was, it really felt like we'd achieved the things we'd set out to do when we, because, you know, our, our um, expectations were never that it wasn't that we, we didn't have high expectations of what we wanted to do i mean really we blundered into this step by step competition and, but, winners yeah and it was yeah it was gradual wasn't it <laughs> but you know to get to do all those shows i mean for, do you want to talk about freak valley briefly kev or do, let's let's roll back let's talk about the hawkwin gigs i think because like oh, i say they were quite yeah. stressful um at the time for obvious reasons however mm. the there was there was still a lot of joy i mean the hawkwin guys were great you know um, lovely, right? we were hanging out with dibs and you know um dave brock and you know which is all surreal in itself the venues were mm. amazing um and just this thing of like we're we're doing a couple of dates with hawkwind it just <laughs> felt very joyous being with our friends Students, you yeah. know um it's it's that road trip kind of thing isn't it well yeah, and we met the guys from Hawkwind at Rambling Man, and That's then they right. invited us to do um, Hawk Easter, which ah, was yeah. in Morecambe. So, um, and which which we were very excited because Evil Blizzard played; they were great. Yep. Steve Hillage played, and you know when we were kids, Steve System Hillage was, was very cool. Yeah, very cool sort of dude, um, and everyone loves Steve Hillage's guitar playing. Um, uh, but you know they they were really good as well, weren't mm. they? The, 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 and then we got to do the two gigs opening for them. Dave Brock was really nice to us, wasn't he? Yeah, really cool. Really you cool. Know, and he, they said that, you know, he really liked us and wanted us to do the gigs, which was just amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's a really sweet guy, and everybody was really nice. Yeah, it was. You know, I've just, all I've got is, is, is all I've got from those Hawkwind shows is they were just lovely, and the Hawkwind fans as well were lovely, and they're just a nice people to hang out with. You know, yeah. it, was, it was great, wasn't it? It kind of got us through it. You know, yeah, um, I think you know because you know I weren't a well man, but um, I think as well you appreciate. Um, it was just bizarre, wasn't it? And it then, was and then bizarre. I think I took. I think when we did the we did the Lexington after that, didn't we? That's right. Yeah, and that was pretty good. But um, you know, I I kind of got myself in a good sort of state by then. I'd lost yeah. weight, and I was I was I was kind of on the on the road to being sorted. Yes. Um, and then I think we took some time off, didn't we? We did, yeah. We, we just to, just so I got until I was properly better. That's right, yeah. We didn't want to. We we just but we just cancelled um, everything we could, you know, um, and yeah, rebooked and we, everything we just else. Did the did the ones we had to, we could do, and then um, after Christmas we had that run of we did the we did the um, we did the uh, Hope and Anchor, didn't we? Yeah. Because years ago, when me and Kev were kids, we played in a, we played the Hope and Anchor, and there was hardly anyone there. Yeah. So I mean, even though it's a tiny venue, it was nice to go back and sell it out and hang out yeah. with people, and it was a really great little show that was. It was, and that yeah, was really our warm up for Freak Valley. Now, Freak Valley is one of those festivals I'd always wanted to get us on. I mean, ever since because it's a weird one because people sort of see us as a progressive rock band or a psychedelic rock band, or a stoner rock band, or a post-rock band. It's all in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of progressive rock fans think we're post-rock bands, but most post-rock fans would go, well, they're not f- post-rock. They're not traditional post-rock, are they? And no. Traditional post-rock, post-rock. A lot of the post-rock fans can be very... Um, it must tick this box plus this box. A lot of genre, it's the same with all genres, really. Yeah. But because we haven't got a singer... And we do music that has uh, yeah. elements of spacey psychedelic stuff, has elements of um, King Crimson and the Mad Vision Orchestra, elements of um, uh, uh, post rocky sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, in all sorts of different sort of um, and those big sort of Melvinsy riffs. Yeah. But also, we like indie rock. We like you know Sonic Youth. We like um, some Vincent. Johnny Marr. We, we like Johnny Marr. There's all sorts of stuff in there. So, um, you know, Led Zeppelin we like. We like classic rock bands. We like Aphex Twin and we like Boards of Canada. You know, there's yeah. all sorts of stuff in there. So I think if we had a vocalist, it'd be a lot easier to pin us down, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, very much so, yeah. I think it's, it's confusing for people, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we've done Cosfest, um, which is kind of like a fantastic psychedelic festival. Um, that oh, so we did fun. a new day, which is kind of a classic rock festival, which is really well run and really lovely. The people are great there. Yeah, and we did Freak Valley, 
Yes. Now, Freak Va- so Freak Valley was um, headlined by Corrosion of Conformity, wasn't it? That's right. Well, it was interesting because you'd kind of somehow had kind of um, got talking to the, uh, the chap that runs it. Um, Jens, yeah. Jens. And um, he'd actually originally offered us to play the year before. But, yeah, that's but right, there yeah. was some scheduling mishap, and he's he's such a cool guy. I remember because I was he's I was lovely, the one yeah. um, um, dealing with it, uh, booking with it, and he contacted me and said, like, you know, I'm really sorry, guys. You know, we're trying to, you know, schedule everything, and might not be able to get you on this year, or if we do, it'd be a weird slot or something. Um, am I okay to shift you to next year? When, as it turns out, for us, that was perfect. You know, it was a, yeah, a definitely bit of, yeah. bit of serendipity there, but. Um, but he, he still said to us, like, you know, just you, any of you want to come, just, you know, I'll give you a guest list and just just come. Um, just to clarify, Freak Valley is actually in Germany. So um, yeah. <laughs> we couldn't quite just hop over there. To be honest, though, if he said that again to us, I'd be quite tempted to go. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah, it? 100%. Yeah, yeah. But um, true to his word, the next year, Jen was like, yeah, great. So you're booked. Um, and the lineup was just amazing. Yeah, the, the headlines yeah. were. Corrosion and conformity, which for me and Matt especially were the um, the album Deliverance. Deliverance, yeah, was we used to listen to it all the time oh, when we were kids. And we used this, to it. this tour that they were doing was actually them playing Deliverance. Um, so for us, that was a big deal. Uh, mm. There was Wolf Mother, not a band I'm that familiar with, but there you go. God is an astronaut. Um, who else was playing? Uh, Brant Bjork, of course. Grant Bjork from Grant Bjork, yes. yeah. Um, the obsessed, but I think the obsessed had to pull out in the end. Um, Tuba, an amazing Greek band. Um, Tuba, were good, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yob, who was actually like, like, sharing a hotel like, with them. I mean, it? to be honest, every band I saw, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, the standard of bands really, really high. Yeah, um, a bit like, like you know, Cosfest is a very similar sort of thing, really. Yeah, um, but um, it was just a really cool festival, really good vibe. Um, they looked after us so well. I mean, they, yeah. you know, they covered everything and looked after us, and you know, it was just. Oh. It was, uh, it was, my friend, our, our friend James came. He called it Valhalla, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm sure yeah, it was fantastic. A lot of uh, musicians out there have got different stories, but anybody who's you know been a touring musician will will probably tell you that most places in Europe look after you, but in Germany they really look after you. <laughs> Um, so we were yeah. we were well catered for um it was amazing and it everybody was... backstage there was a huge backstage area where a lot of the bands were hanging out everybody was in a good mood there was no divas everybody no, was just was really nothing. cool with each other um we made some great friends there we um in our also staying in our hotel was a band from america called the great electric quest they were, we were cool guys really cool they? guys um and um slowmatics and the Slomatics, who oh, are just a great oh man, this it's yeah. such a great band, massive riff band, right? Oh yeah, but awesome. the, the, you know that bit in um, Shaun of the Dead, yeah, you know when they they meet their counterparts, <laughs> it was like that. It was it was bizarre. We all like the same things. We we'll meet these sort of guys from you know and from a different they're, they're from um, Northern Ireland, don't they? Yeah, and they were like very. Just had exactly the same sense of humour. I think they're about the same age as us, and you yeah, know, seen to similar stuff. And they, you know, and they're just ah, oh, they're just epic people. Taking around. Yeah, and I mean, we just had such a great time. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they won't mind us saying as well. They're, they've now, so they were they were due to play that year, um, <laughs> which was uh, 2019, um, and they flew over and they use uh, some quite unusually tuned guitars that they have set up specifically. And I can't remember what airline they flew with, but their guitars didn't turn up. So right, um, yeah. they were due to go on immediately after us, I believe. Um, and um, yeah, they they contacted Jens. Jens, again, being, you know, such a cool guy. He was like, well, you know, um, we maybe if you borrow some equipment, you can go on later. But then because some of it was being televised and the TV didn't want to reschedule. So um, basically they, they were... They came to the festival, but they didn't play. So they just hung out backstage and uh, had a lovely time. Um, and uh, they put together a jam band of various other bands that kind of um, stood in in, uh, in their place. Because I, I, I love this story. We, when we came off, um, there were a few people sort of, you know, as we were packing kit away down the front who asked us for, you know, our set lists or plectrums or whatever. And um, 
Stuart gave his uh, drumsticks to, there was a kid down the front and he gave his drumsticks to the kid who he was asking for them. And then as we was packing away, uh, one of the sound guys came up to Stuart on the side of the stage and said, oh, um, do you have a drumstick? And Stuart, thinking it was, you know, for a, an, another fan or something, gave him one of the drumsticks and said, oh yeah, you know, you know. And then the guy looked at him and then just said, do you have another drumstick? And then that's when we realised that the uh, the um, the jam band that they put together, the drummer didn't actually have any sticks and was just asking Stuart to borrow sticks. But I just remember <laughs> looking at Stuart, the, the look of disappointment in his face. <laughs> Amazing. Was, there was, there was, there was, it was great though. I mean, it was a really good festival. I'm really glad, you know, we got to play in Germany. I, I want to go back to Germany at some yeah, point yeah. as well. So and also really as well, cool. we, we've, we've got to the point now where we bump into people. So... Um, We'd played um, a couple of psych festivals in England, uh, Sonic Rock Solstice, on board the craft, all that kind oh, of stuff. Yeah. And there was um, our friends from Wales, La Satilia. Um, yeah, they're nice. Very guys, cool yeah. band. And they nice were playing um, Freak Valley as well. So it's so weird when you, you, know, you drive across Europe to a different country and you sort of walk into the backstage area and it's like, hey, how's it going, man? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's quite a small sort of scene. It's really it cool. Yeah. So we got Freak Valley done. Um, and then we got booked for the next year. We had the Netherlands. We did. And Italy. Mm -hmm. Plus some other festival shows. Yeah. And basically this, 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 you know, this is the year we're in now. We were just going to be doing a few gigs and writing a new album. That's right. Um, and then we did, so we, so we did the Hope and Anchor again as a warm up to go to the Netherlands to play we with did. Anathema. Yeah. So it was a big show, you know, a lot of people, big show. A lot show. of people. Yeah, Catatonia and uh, Anathema. 5,000, I think it's 5,000, something like that. 5,000. And our, then our mate Charlie is um, now the bass player in um, Anathema, isn't he? That's right, yeah. So he's going to be out there. And I know some of the Anathema guys, and they're really nice. And um, and a load of other other mates with bands are playing. Um, Pineapple, Th Bruce Sword. Yeah. Um, quite a few people we know. And Jerry was going. It's, it was going to be a really good too. I mean, yeah. Definitely, uh, definitely then, more than... More than a few light ales would be consumed. Yeah. And then, obviously, you know, we are where we are now, three months into a quarantine. So, yeah, you know, that's, this is the way it is. But so so we did this, we did the Hope and Anchor. And, and to be honest, Stuart really messed his, um, he had, was it tennis elbow? Yeah, um, it was. Uh, Stuart, Stuart really tried to move a cabinet um, full of vinyl records without taking the vinyl records out front first. Pulled and, somebody, didn't he? Yeah, and uh, had really badly damaged his arm. And there were a few things, other things going on as well. So we, yeah, it was it was a bit touch and go whether we were going to be match fit for the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, as it turns it out, it didn't matter. Didn't matter at all. So, you know, obviously it's, everything's going bonkers at the minute because yeah, it's a, it's a very strange time. So what we're doing at the moment is um, we've got 85 bits of songs. Yes. <laughs> and we've got... Um, Basically, we've all got computer setups at home. I, I've got a laptop in front of me with all my guitar gear, and loads mm -hmm. of pedals and a few guitars. St um, Steve's got a laptop and a guitar. Um, Stuart's got an electric drum kit. And Kev's got all his gear with his bass and keyboards. I've got keyboards here as well. So what we're doing is basically pe pe putting together demos of these things. I mean, Kev's in charge because he's the one who does all the mixing and... <laughs> The arrangements and and you know how to cut and paste on your door and I don't know. Yeah, how to I know do how to that, cut and so. paste. That's the main thing. <laughs> I went on the course to learn how to cut and paste. As you've got the cut and paste facilities in place. Yeah, you know you're you're certainly beyond my abilities. I tend to just you know, whack it in. But we're, um, we're saving up for quantize. Quantize, yeah. I can quantize <laughs> MIDI, but I don't know how to do audio. Yeah. Um, so, but so what we've been doing is basically trying to put all these bits together, and we've kind of got. Um, uh, Probably, probably quite a few songs almost ready. It's yeah. just coming together now. They're, they're so. just coming to focus, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we're not, we're taking our time because, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, if we're going to put stuff out, there's no point continuing unless we're going to try and do stuff that's as good or better than what we've done before. Yeah. And it's also different. And is it is certainly no point chucking out the euphoric too because no, no one cares exactly, about that, yeah. do they? So just trying to do things people will be surprised but ultimately the most important thing for us is to keep ourselves interested you know what I mean 100% and in fact I can actually draw a line I mean you know I, I could almost draw one from Freak Valley I mean I remember coming back from Freak Valley and just thinking about how being around the talent and the you know the 
command that a lot of these bands have. It was like, okay, cool, right? We need to we need to find another gear. You know, you always think yeah. you're in top gear. You're not. There's always another gear. No. And we and so we'd been talking about this kind of stuff anyway. Um, and I think as well, um, Cosfest. You know, that's where the, some of the lessons we took from Freak Valley came with us to Cosfest. So. Um, when we, uh, on the live recording there, I think it's, you know, we, we've got a lot of the energy that we kind of picked up from Freak Valley. Um, and so, you know, we was thinking about, okay, if we want to be, you know, filling out these stages, whether it be small or big, we want to, you know, be doing interesting things and, you know, be aware of the audience and how it's, this is all like a very unifying kind of experience, a live show. Um, so we, we had all these things going around in our head and we'd actually been talking a lot about, you know, uh, getting somewhere permanent for us to rehearse and record and, you know, all this kind of stuff and, you know, talking about investing a little bit of our own money into things and, you know, just so we could get some kind of work in progress, um, better, just some sort of work in practice. Um, however, along came a worldwide pandemic, um, <laughs> obviously, you know, massively traumatic for so many different reasons for so many different yeah, people. Yeah, it's heartbreaking um, because the yeah, amount of people... Absolutely. You know, the amount of people have lost people as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I've tried to keep cheery and keep smiling. Absolutely, you know, yeah, yeah. But when you do think about the the, the overall effects of it, it's terrifying, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, 100%. But the one thing, again, I'm going to try and draw a positive from it, is that it forced us to say, right, well, okay, we can't, you know, carry on as we were before. That's That's not going to happen now. And to be honest you know, maybe if we find a new way of working, this is something that we can carry on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to approach each time we make an album. And, you know, if you listen to the nonsense we've been talking for the last, you know, episodes of the podcast is that each album we've approached in different ways. Yeah. And this one will be different again because we haven't been playing in the same room together. Yep. It's a you different know, way of writing for th- us, isn't it? This is, you know, there's a lot, and there's lots of things you can do it makes you think about the parts you're putting down mm-hmm. a lot more and you know and it's, 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 it's there's none of the practicalities of playing live yeah you know there's a lot not the because we're not rehearsing it because if you listen to, like i say a lot of stuff we've done in the past has worked out in the rehearsal room mm-hmm. whereas this is all being done onto laptops and you know i'm i'm treating the guitar as more as a as a, as a found sound thing rather than a riff machine you know I mean, it's a horrible cliche to say but more than you know, as a trying to come up with interesting sounds with it, you know what I mean. Try and each song we do to try different things on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and I'm I'm finding it all very exciting. If if I'll be honest, it's it doesn't feel like a compromise. It feels like it's actually a new breathed, you know, new yeah. new life into it. I mean, to some people, this would seem such an alien way of working. You know, we're not in the same room together. However, you know, as as we've spoken about before, we're well aware a lot of our friends' bands, this is how they've worked for years. You know, they've got people who are, you know, some somebody lives in France, somebody lives in, you know, England, somebody lives in Germany, you know, and that's how they work, you know, and it, it's possible. And they, and they always say that, it's, to be honest, it's how most bands work these days, isn't mm. it? They all, I mean, I, I found it, I mean, yeah, it's difficult, but also I'm starting to hear the results. Yeah. And there's stuff in there that, you know, with the arrangements, we're spending more time on the arrangements, we're doing different things, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, but it is trial to work. I mean, I've, I've in the last few months, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's stressful, and it's and it's been, you know, it's been a difficult time for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I really feel for the people who lost people as well. I mean, I can't yeah, imagine 100%. what they've been through. You know what I mean? Mm. And the people have been ill, and the people have, you know, mental health wise, it's been difficult. And also, you know, there's been um, a lot of events in the last few weeks as well where things have happened as well. So. And it's really made me think about, you know, the way we approach things and the way we approach life in general, you know what I mean? About yeah, and the best way to move forward from that. How we can be kinder and how we can, you know, be better, be better people. And I think that's, you know, one of the things I've learned really. And, you know, take a step back and think, well, you know, what what's going on here? How can we be kinder? How can we be better? How can, you know, how can we... And also, you know, the, their own community within the... Fish and did Facebook group, and um, the people who who come to our gigs, the people who we talk to online, and you know how we can continue to try and make that a nicer place, a kinder place, and yeah. a more supportive place. So, absolutely, hopefully, you know we can we can continue to work on that. Yeah, 
I mean, it's we didn't actually go into it last time, but um, it's one of the reasons the uh, the album "The Euphoric" is called "The Euphoric" and not "Euphoric" um, because we we talked a lot again, and uh, I mentioned it just briefly a, a minute ago. We've we one of the things we've always spoken about um, is when when a gig's working, when the audience are kind of getting what you're doing and you're, you know, you're, you know, it's, it's quite, it's really unifying and yeah. th that, that yeah. shared experience. Um, that's why we called it the euphoric because we just feel like when everybody's in that space, the, the musicians, the, the audience, they're all part of one experience. It's just as vital to the live performance as the musicians, you know, the audiences. Um, I think, the and quality of the performance is very much dependent on the quality of the audience. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think a lot of the time the audience realises how much they have a, you know, their part of it being a good gig or not. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like they're, I think so much of, you know, I think one of the, some of the best gigs we've done, I mean, like those little black heart shows, the mm. Hope and Anchor, just those tiny shows, but with the people that we, we know and like, and, you know, they're, they're our friends and people yeah. we think the world of. and to play those shows with those guys it just was just lovely so yeah exactly um, exactly so uh just to conclude then what do you, what's your been high, highlight to the last 10 years i mean I'll, we've spoken uh before about this is is that every every time i think well there you go that's it we've you know we've um i don't know we've supported hawkwind we've played rambling man we've gone to germany and played free we've gone to america every time i think well, there you go. That's the that's the high point, and then something else comes along, and you know we're not, um, you know, we're, I mean, you can tell the, if you just look at us, you know, we're not career hungry. You know, we're not quitting <laughs> our, our day jobs to become musicians, although we'd love to. Um, you know, it, it's it's something that we're we're very serious about, um, but we just seem to just do what we love doing and people just seem to offer us cool stuff yeah. it's all been done with a lot of um hopefully been a lot of joy in it and a lot of yeah. fun for the people i mean we've had a good time and hopefully yeah. people who who have um who've, who've been involved in it and hopefully the, the other thing is to try and build a community around the music we've been doing and, and you know the people and try and make it a nice community not, absolutely i mean if, one of the good things i remember when we um posted the Black Lives Matter thing in the Fist and Dead Facebook group. Yeah. And I saw in a lot of groups, you saw some quite negative yeah, stuff. people didn't get it, did they? But in our group, there was nothing at all. Everyone yeah. was really cool. And I was so proud. I was I was so proud that our lot, did, there was no, um, no, no negativity at all. And I was really pleased about that. Yeah. Um, having seen some of the, you know, horrible stuff we saw online. So... Yeah, it, uh, I think the community we've built around the band is the thing I'm I'm out of the ten years is the thing I'm most proud of, and, and you yeah, know, just yeah, to, to be a band from Roston to play Rosfest and to go to America and go to Germany and Freak yeah. Valley and Hawkwind and you know, there's a lot of things there that you know, Rambling Man and and you know, there's people who have helped, but we've had a lot of help, you know. Like, John Patrick, if if John Patrick hadn't put us on a celebrate in front yes. of three or four hundred people, we never would cope with Rambling Man. If we hadn't done Rambling Man, we never would have coped with Rosfest. Yeah. If we hadn't done Rosfest, we never would have been ready for Hawkwind. Yeah. And if we hadn't done Hawkwind, we wouldn't cope with Freak Valley. So it was all one step at a time. It was all done. It's all. It was all a you know gradual growth thing. But the thing, the thing I'm most you know that means most to me is the audience we built around the music. That's and very true. Just to be honest, you know, the four of us, we've all been with really good friends and yeah. we haven't fallen out. We haven't, you know, there's never been any problems really. And, and we've managed just to keep it going for 10 years. It's, it's quite hard to keep a band going for 10 years. We've done three albums, three EPs, three live albums. Um, hopefully we're going into an era now that will be um, basically, you know, the start of a new era where it's going to, we're going to try and take some more chances and yeah. maybe bring in vocals or synthesizers and more or more samples or more orchestration or, and just take more chances. I think the people who, you know, uh, who listen to our music uh, kind of expect us to take chances because that's what we've always done. Choreography so, now, yeah. that's the way forward. We're really working on the choreography now. Yeah, I'm going um, to, I think that shadows routine is the way forward. <laughs> You know the one, or we could do a Morecambe and Wise um, Christmas special one. 
you enjoy Steve's really got the break dancing down now. You can spin on his head yeah, and everything. Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> 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 it reminds me of that uh, bit in Only Fools and Horses where they take Rodney on a holiday. Yeah, so um, going forward as well, um, we've kind of, I, I don't know, should we call this the end of season one? Um, yeah, it's, it's, so this is the end of the, the first season because we just, basically we wanted to learn how to do this podcast in Lark um, and get sort of confident with it. And then, yeah, so this is the end of season one of the podcast. What what I thought, you know, perhaps we could do is we could do um, some things where we get some of our friends on yeah. and just talk to them because they're far more interesting than we are. <laughs> and just, you know, now we know how to make the buttons work. Yeah. And, we, and we'll whack all these episodes up on like iTunes and Spotify. Hopefully we've learned how to do it now. So, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're know, enjoying we can, it as well. So we're going to keep going. Yeah, it's been, it's been good, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, also, you know, context is... If we're not going to do gigs, there's, there's other things we can do to engage with people. We can still put, make video content. We are, you know, we've got those pedal demos. We can talk to people about some of the music we really love. Yeah. And we can continue to make music remotely. And then eventually, when all things return back to normal, hopefully the community will still be there. Hopefully we'll still be enjoying it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we do it because we love it. I mean, we don't... There's we do. no there's no grand plan, as you can, as as you may have noticed if you were listening yeah. to this podcast. We're very lucky. We get to make music that we want to make. Um, we're not, you know, being twisted around by we should be more like this or we should be more like that. We we literally we literally get to do anything we want, and we've got people that seem happy to go go with us on whatever journey that that takes them on. So yeah, uh, no, you, know, you can't lucky. you can't beat that. Can hopefully, you? It'll, hopefully it'll continue. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Who knows? The world's a bizarre place and things have been weird the last few months, haven't they? But That's an understatement, yeah. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd say, yeah, beyond weird. The, in, you know, I've been, I've been inside, but, I've, you know, really, I've been lucky. I think, it was, you know, I just miss me family and friends, but I think, you know, a lot of people have been through it, been really through it and it's been a tough time. So, yep. um, hopefully we can continue to uh, spread a message of positivity and... Try and keep things positive and enjoy doing it. As uh, as the great Robert Ramsey once said, um, I don't know why, <laughs> but I feel euphoric. Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> right, well, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone listening. Um, Shall we do the word, Kevin? Yeah, what, what do you want, Matt? Uh, I've got super fuzz. Super fuzz, that's a good one. Super fuzz, good one, yeah. Yeah. So that's the, um, that's, that's the end. Thank you for listening. <laughs> We will be back. We will be back with more stuff. We've just got to figure out how to uh, how to how to involve other people in this now. I think you need to sort that internet out in your um, yeah. your castle in the sky, Kevin. I live in a castle in the sky. Yeah, I do. <laughs> We're not even joking. It's not a castle. It's in the sky, but it's not a castle. It's definitely in the sky. <laughs> so thanks for listening. Um, as always, you know, if you've got any questions or anything like that, you you know where we are. We're, we're always around somewhere on the internet, on that there internet. So um, get in touch. Um, if you got all the way through this stick super fuzz in the comments um, and we will see you very soon cheers for listening take care guys bye